Hello, in this series of videos, I'm going to be going through the first AAT sample assessment for PNTA, which is the personal tax optional unit under the new Q2022 syllabus. OK, so um, when we open up the new assessment, uh, we, we get these instructions, which are going to be the same as in the real thing. So we have two hours for this exam once we press the start button. Um, there are written responses or human marked, at least for tasks one, four and eight. 10 tasks altogether, it's marked out of 100. So without further ado, let's continue on to task number one, which is 10 marks, 10% 10 of the exam. So this is the only uh, purely written task in the exam, broken down into component parts. So it's about the principles and rules underpinning tax. So to begin with, there are five principles which underpin the taxation systems. State and define any three. Right, so if you've done your, your kind of your knowledge, you will know, and this isn't what the answer will look like, but um, neutrality is one, efficiency, Certainty and simplicity, effective and fair, and flexible. They are my five principles. So I can choose any three of these. So there will be one mark for stating three of these and then one mark for explaining them. So I'm going to choose the ones that I think are easiest to explain. So flexible um, is quite a good one able to keep pace with technological, technological and commercial changes. So that means that the tax system well, basically is able to keep itself up to date. Uh, what other was a good one? Efficiency, that's quite an easy one to remember. Uh, minimising admin costs for both the business and the government. So that one, neutrality is all about um, sort of being fair to different types of businesses, could go with that. Certainty and simplicity, uh, that's quite an easy one to explain. Tax rules are clear and understandable. Effective and fair, if I had gone for that one, um, making sure that people are taxed the, the right amount at the right time. So. Having prepared my answer, I could delete those two and tidy it up a bit. That would get me my six marks, hopefully, in the bag. Moving on to part B. You work in a small accounting practice and your manager has handed you the file of a client which has been with the practice for a number of years. You know that the client is resident and domiciled in the UK. Whilst the client has always declared all UK income to HMRC, he has recently been receiving rental income from an overseas property. The client has emailed you stating that as the property is not based in the UK, he thinks that he does not need to declare this income to HMRC. Right, so residence and domicile, key um, topics that you need to be familiar with for this exam. So as, um, as the client is both UK resident and UK domiciled, so just a reminder, UK resident is about where you live in the current tax year, sort of subject to certain rules, which you can find in the reference material. Um, UK domiciled is more about your sort of permanent place. Um, often people just take the domicile of origin. Um, but we don't need to worry about whether they are or whether they're not in this question, because as you can see, if I just highlight there, um, the client is rem resident and domiciled in the UK. Um, so as the client is both UK and 
resident and domiciled. Um, this means they must pay UK tax on all, or I'll say on worldwide income and gains. We'll put, add the word all in there. All worldwide income and gains. All right, so there's no room for negotiation. So we state that point. Um, so it's asking me to explain why the income needs to be declared to HMRC. So the practices actions if the client refuses to make this declaration. So moving on, if the client refuses to make this declaration, and then what I would do is I would look in the reference material. So we have down here all the stuff about the, the ethical side of things. So I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to find it. So I'm going to just have a look. I'm looking for there's a flow chart I'm familiar with because I've ah oh, here it is. So dealing with errors. Does the client authorise a disclosure? So it's talking here about if the client is initially unwilling after oral advice on the consequences, um, if the client remains unwilling after written advice on the consequences. So you basically try to persuade the client. Um, this particular question is saying if the client refuses to make this declaration. So if the client refuses to make the declaration, I'm using this bit of information as reference, we would have to advise the client in writing that you can no longer act. So I'm, I'm putting a colon there and I'm using bullets in my answer. Um, advise the client in writing that you can no longer act for them regarding tax matters. Um, we would notify H, oh, what's happened to my answer down here, uh, notify, oops, notify HMRC that um, we have ceased to act for the client. Um, I would probably add there, but um, do not disclose. My thing's gone a bit able. Anyway. Um, so notify HMRC that we have ceased to act for the client, but do not disclose the reasons why, as this would be breach of confidentiality. Um, and then here, consider whether a report should be made for money laundering. So down here, consider whether a report should be made regarding money laundering as tax evasion. Um, is illegal. So that would fall under that requirement. Um, well, I think that's probably the main point. So let's get rid of that reference material. Make sure we've tidied up our answer. If the client refuses to make this declaration, just have these as separate bullet points. There we go. And my answer would look something like that. Press the answer button and we are on to task two.